What happens when a rail joint gap is off by just a few millimetres? Buckles, broken fish plates, even train derailments. This is a detail most passengers never see or are even aware of, but track engineers know it can make or break the track, literally. In this video, you'll learn what joint gaps actually do, how they handle thermal expansion, what joint closure temperature is, and why setting gaps wrong has real world consequences. Before we jump into talk of thermal forces and buckles, let's look at what a rail joint actually is. Rail joints are, as the name suggests, a way of joining two rails together. Prior to welding, this was the way all rails were joined. Holes are drilled in the rails, fish plates are placed either side and then bolts used to secure the rail ends together, keeping them aligned and providing a constant smooth surface for the train wheel to run along. When it comes to joints, there are two distinct types. The first type is the fish plated or expansion joint. The most noticeable feature is the gap between the rail ends. More on this in a minute. The second type is a tight joint. This is used in welded track when a weld cannot be completed. This could be for a number of reasons, such as a defect or poor rail condition. In contrast to the fish plated joint, and as the name suggests, the ends of the rails are tied together and the joint can be stressed like continuously welded rail. We won't cover tight joints in this video, they follow different rules. But let me know in the comments if you'd like a separate video on them. So, fish plated joints, also called expansion joints, the joints with the gap are designed with one key purpose, allowing movement. I know this sounds strange when I've just said that a joint's main job is to keep the two ends of the rails aligned with each other, but it's true. The specific movement I'm talking about is expansion and contraction of the rail material. What are these design features? The fish plates either side of the rail only actually contact the rail at the top and bottom. This reduces the contact surface area and friction between the rail and the fish plate, allowing freer movement. The bolt holes in the rail are drilled bigger than the bolts themselves, with the holes in the fish plates a different size again, all to allow movement. Then there is the all-important gap. This is intentionally left between the rail ends, giving a space for the rail's steel to expand into. More on the size of this gap later. Fish plated joints do have their problems. Talk to any maintainer and you'll probably hear a long list. I've actually covered that in another video. Links in the top right hand corner of the screen now. With them being a bit of a problem child, why have they not disappeared from the railway completely? Well, they are useful for certain areas, like older or lower speed track where upgrades to CWR can't be justified, so the joints are just replaced as and when needed. Or it could be the welded and stressed track cannot be installed, so joints are the only option. One area welded track cannot be installed is curves with a tight radius. Installing and stressing CWR on tight curves is tricky and potentially dangerous due to the high forces involved and keeping the rail in the correct position. Most railways have a minimum allowable radius for welded rail, below which jointed track must be used. Now you know about joints. Let's look at thermal forces, the power they have and the reason joint gaps exist in the first place. But before we do that, if you're finding this video interesting and want to learn even more about the railway and the engineering behind it, I've got two free resources for you. First, I have a free six day email course that breaks down the fundamentals of horizontal track geometry perfect for building a solid foundation of knowledge. Second, just for signing up to my email list, I'll send you my free Guide to Cant ebook. Cant is one of the most crucial concepts in railway engineering, and this guide will give you everything you need to understand it clearly. Both are completely free. Just check the link in the top right hand corner or in the description below to grab them now. So, thermal forces. Steel, which is used to make rails, expands when heated and contracts when cooled, like any metal. This means that rails also expand and contract, changing their length. A rail in the track under the summer sun will be longer than one covered in a winter frost. A key part of the job of a number of track components, like the base plates and clips, is to keep the rail in place and secure. This is needed to ensure trains can run safely. After all, we don't want rails becoming loose and shifting out of alignment. But this restraint does prevent the rails expanding and contracting as they wish as the temperature changes. This leads to forces building in the rails, the type of which depends on how the rail is acting. If the rail tries to expand its length but can't due to clips, plates and other components in the track system, compressive forces build up. Think of a spring being squashed. If the rail is contracting or shortening but the restraint is there holding it at a certain length, then the rail goes into tension, like a rope in a tug of war. If these forces get too high, one of two things happen. Excessive compressive force? looking for a path of least resistance, can push the rails sideways, causing a buckle. 
With the tension, it can get to such a level that the rail cannot withstand it any longer and snaps. Managing these thermal forces is an important part of track design and maintenance. In jointed track, thermal forces is managed through the joint gap, the intentionally left space between the rail ends. Yes, this gap mentioned earlier has a job. This is known as the joint gap. I know, imaginative name. This gap gives space for the rail to expand into, preventing the buildup of compressive forces. Getting this gap right is very important. Too small and the gap closes up before the rail has expanded very much. This leads to the rail ends pushing against each other, which in turn leads to the buildup of compressive forces and possibly a buckle. But too big and the gap will never fully close up. Not so much of an issue in the summer, but in the winter this can lead to big tensile forces when the rails contract and can lead to fish plates breaking. So, setting the joint gap is crucial to getting a fish plated joint to perform correctly all through the year. But how is the right gap picked? The answer is something called joint closure temperature or JCT. This is the temperature at which the gap between the rail ends should fully close, meaning zero gap, as a result of the thermal expansion of the rail. To be clear, it is the temperature of the rail itself, not the air temperature. These are often very different, with the rail temperature being the higher of the two. The joint closure temperature used in the UK is 38 degrees Celsius. So when the rails are at 38 degrees or above, the gap between the rail ends in jointed track should be zero. To calculate the correct gap, this equation can be used. It uses the coefficient of thermal expansion for steel, the rail length, the current rail temperature, and your target JCT. It is very similar to the equation used when determining the extension or stressing required during the installation of continuously welded rail. You can find out more about that in the video shown in the top right hand corner now. The equation can also be rearranged to determine the JCT that has been achieved. UK standards helpfully lay out the required gaps at set temperatures so you don't have to run the calculation each time. Let me know in the comments if other standards around the world do the same and what JCT they use. Installing the joints with the correct gap is a great start, but just the beginning. The cycle of expansion and contraction, along with other maintenance activities such as rail changing or lifting and packing the track, can all cause the joint gaps to change over time. This in turn changes how the track, as a system, responds to the changes in temperature. Closing up of the joint gaps reduces the JCT. To combat this, surveys are undertaken of the existing joint gaps and then the JCT for that section of jointed track is calculated. If the JCT for a section of track is below the requirement, mitigations can be put in place and work plan to reset or regulate the joints. This is all typically undertaken as part of the maintenance activities done to prepare the track for the summer months, known as summer prep. The other key maintenance activity is ensuring that the fish plated joints can move effectively, allowing the required expansion and contraction. This is done by ensuring the joints are correctly lubricated. You can find out more about this in the video shown in the top right now. I can fully understand that when we're talking about gaps of just a few millimetres between rail ends, it's quite easy to think, eh, it cannot be that important. But do not underestimate the power of an expanding rail. This is really well illustrated in the derailment near Cumbersdale in Cumbria in 2009. Joints with ineffective gaps, which lowered the JCT for the length of track, coupled with a hot day and other factors led to the track buckling and a train derailing. I've linked to the accident report in the top right if you want to read more about it. Now you know how a small gap between rail ends helps manage thermal forces and prevent buckles or breaks throughout the year. Let me know how joints are maintained where you are in the comments below. I'd be interested to compare practices across the different networks and countries. On screen now is a video I think you might like. And if you found this video useful, don't forget to hit that like or subscribe button and check out my other videos on railway engineering. See you in the next one.